this week to be closer to China. On October 31st, the fourth plenary session of the 19th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China concluded in Beijing. What happened? Why was it significant? Why is the party focusing on upholding and improving socialism with Chinese characteristics? Why on advancing the modernization of China's system and capacity for governance? What are the driving motivations, the implications? What are the features of the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics? And what does modernization mean for China's system and capacity for governance? Can the Chinese word for system, Zhidu, help? This week, assess China's path and China's system to be closer to China. The fourth plenary session of the 19th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, the CPC, which concluded here in Beijing on October 31st, focused on two big initiatives. First, on upholding and improving the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics. And second, on making progress in modernizing China's system and capacity for governance. These two big initiatives are related in that the reason why China's system is deemed optimal for China is to a significant extent its enhanced capacity for governance. Don't be lulled by the formal, perhaps turgid, language of plenum communiques. Plenums are potent. They are the CPC's highest level forum when members of the CPC Central Committee, the party's highest organ of state in authority, composed currently of 204 full members and 172 alternate members, meet for official discussions of major issues and authorize official prescriptions of policy guidance. To appreciate party plenums, we should understand their foundation, China's path and China's model. We explore China's path and China's model and their relationship to be closer to China. The Communist Party of China, the CPC, and the Chinese government have long made eradicating poverty and achieving common prosperity one of their major tasks. And to achieve these goals, at the end of 2018, 775,000 officials were mobilized to work on the front lines of poverty alleviation, with 200,000 serving as first party secretaries in villages. One of them is Wang Haijun, who lived apart from his family for four years, devoting himself to raising living standards of Lingmen village in Hainan province, for example, by learning the needs of local villagers and providing help. Poverty alleviation is organized in five layers, meaning that five levels of party secretaries are involved, provincial, municipal, county, township, and village levels. As local governments work under the leadership of party committees at the same level, the party secretary, as the person in charge, is able to mobilize resources for poverty alleviation. With the CPC Central Committee being responsible for overall policies, provincial governments customize policies for their specific conditions. Municipal and county governments focus on implementation, and township and villages, the grassroots, are on the front lines of the battle. From 2012 to 2018, China reduced the poverty-stricken population in rural areas by over 80 million, China states that its achievements, such as in poverty alleviation, is based on China taking its own unique path, 
On November 1st and 2nd, the forum, Chinese Civilization and China's Path, was held in Beijing. The forum explored the mechanisms and meaning of China's path and China's model. I'm joined by Li Junru, former vice president of the Central Party School of the CPC Central Committee, Zhu Bai Fang, vice president, Academy of Chinese Culture, Joseph Gregory Mahoney, professor of political science, East China Normal University, and Fang Ning, secretary of the party committee and researcher of the Institute of Political Science, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Gentlemen, welcome. We are attending the conference of uh, Chinese civilization and China's path at a very opportune moment uh, when the fourth plenum of the CPC 19th Central, uh, 19th Central Committee has, uh, has just concluded, focusing on uh, the importance of upholding and improving China's path of socialism with Chinese characteristics and also uh, perfecting and um, uh, uh, optimizing China's system and capacity for governance. How can we understand China's uh, civilization and, and China's path uh, in terms of uh, uh, the real meaning of it? Socialism with Chinese characteristics is a broad concept that is manifest through four forms. First is path, the socialist path with Chinese characteristics, that is China's path. Second is theories, the theories of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Third is system, the socialist system with Chinese characteristics. Fourth is the socialist culture with Chinese characteristics. In a nutshell, Chinese socialism is composed of four forms, path, theories, system, and culture. What can you tell us about the, the, um, the evolutionary development of such a rich idea? Because if you say the phrase in Chinese or in English, it's a very short phrase, but here we see this, this enormous depth in the different components. So walk us through the process of how this happened. After 40 years of reform and opening up, with our innovative practices, we have found the path. In fact, it's the result not only of the past 40 years, but also our explorations over the past 70 years after the foundation of the People's Republic of China. Looking further back, the nearly one century striving of the CPC is also inseparable with the formation of China's path. People also talk about the China model. So, um, uh, Minister Li, uh, do you distinguish between the China model and China path? Uh, obviously, the model seems to be derived from the path, uh, but are the two, uh, what's the difference between the two in terms of our use of the term? It is a critical concept. Today, Zhongu Daolu is often translated into China's path or China's road, while the former is more frequently used. The translation is all right, but fails to deliver a critical connotation of Zhongu Daolu, China's path. China's Daolu, however, is not a general path, as it refers to a path that is in line with laws. How could it possibly be easy to explore the laws? It takes trial and error to finally figure out some rules. Another critical issue is China's model. Path refers to a dynamic process and the trajectory of something. Model is a relatively steady system formed in completion. What is the significance about the fourth plenary session of the 19th CPC Central Committee? A three-step strategy was proposed. First is what Deng Xiaoping enunciated during his southern tour in 1992, that by 2020, our system is to be more mature and stable. Second, by 2035, our system is to be further improved. And third, by 2050, can we possibly take credit for China's model in building China's path? At this point, no one should boast about any model that we have. What we should engage in is exploration and practices in a diligent manner. If you were asked to define the China model, uh, what would be the elements of it? 
There are philosophical ideas within the theories, and the theories are formed during the course of practices and running through the path. The main manifestation of these theories is the socialism theories with Chinese characteristics. During the development of the path and the theories, we keep accumulating experiences, and we institutionalize the successful experience, and therefore the system is taking shape. For example, the socialist market economy is a system. How is our socialist market economy taking shape already? No one knows for sure. Is that when we talk about a system, we're, we're talking about something that is is not merely uh, an abstract idea, right? Uh, one of the problems with socialism for so many people, and, and this was a problem that, that Marx himself was struggling to, to deal with in, in the Communist Manifesto when he spent so much time trying to talk about scientific socialism, right? But we never really f figured out what scientific socialism while, uh, was while he was alive. And then you have Lenin who's trying to read the Critique of the Gotha program as a means for discerning some type of system. Um, and that didn't work out very well. Um, and in the early days of the People's Republic, there were efforts to build systems, and some of these efforts were adopted from the Soviet Union, of course. And uh, some of those ended up uh, 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 yielding positive results, and others didn't. So I think one of the things that we find uh, with, with, uh, with Deng Xiaoping and the later generations is, you know, we're going to back up, we're going to figure out what works step by step, right? This is where the path, like, it's not predetermined. We don't know. And, and this is a key point, right? And, 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 and I think one of the reasons why Westerners don't understand uh, the Chinese system and don't understand path or the Tao is that th the path or, or, or the model is, is one of perpetual change. It's, it's, it's through the negation of the negation, through dialectics, being Zhang Fa, this idea that you have to not only find the path and create the path, but also constantly adjust and change the path so that you can reach objectives that you don't quite understand yet, but you have a, you have a deep cultural inclination towards, right? Uh, whether this is a sense of, of, of humanity or being human, Ren, whatever it is, in, 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 in the sense of your, of your trajectory through time. To understand the China model, I think it's one of the most important ways that China can communicate its real story, because that word, China model, uh, is, uh, has come to take on a rigidity, an ossification, uh, and maybe a caricature of what China is really all about. So the fact that the China model is, is in transition, as Minister Li is saying, is being uh, improved is a very helpful. So I'd like to understand the kind of research that you do on the China model. Thank you. Uh, Based on my research experience, there are a few key words to mention. The first is stage. When talking about China's model, China's road and China's system, we should stress that they are the products of certain stages, which means they're suitable for the contemporary major development task of China, and that is to achieve industrialization, urbanization, and modernization. Politically, I think the most obvious feature of China's model, if there is a preliminary model or some rules to describe China's model, is the unification of three elements that we have been talking about from the 16th National Congress of the CPC to the 19th National Congress of the CPC. And the three elements are the leadership of the Communist Party of the CPC, and the second is people running the country. And the third is the rule of law. As for the rule of law, I have my research. I participated in the draft of government white paper, building of political democracy in China, and wrote theoretical articles seven or eight years ago. I think the understanding today differs from that of the past. Back then, we believed that the rule of law referred to the CPC's leadership the people running the country and both following the law. Today we have a deeper understanding from the Western perspective. The rule of law is a kind of contract. It is true that power in China is concentrated. The CBC inherited its legitimacy from history and enjoys that legitimacy today from its performance. 
That said, the CBC was not elected by the people. Election embodies a form of continuous authorization, and the CBC does not have that. But still, the CBC's leadership is, in fact, meant to have a contract with the people. That is to say, the CBC is not to lead at will. It is not to issue an order in the morning and rescind it in the evening. It is nothing like that. The CBC's leadership is to turn the people's will and the party's proposals into legal and policy systems under which to implement. That is the rule of law in China rather than the rule of man. Meanwhile, it is a promise to the people. That is, the laws are recognized by the society and the people should jointly follow it. That is how I look at the rule of law in China. We'll be right back. On October 31st, the 19th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, the CPC, concluded its fourth plenary session in Beijing with the release of a communique. Held after the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, the plenum has both historical and practical significance. It reviewed and adopted the CPC Central Committee's decision on how to uphold and improve the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics and how to advance the modernization of China's system and capacity for governance. The plenum underscored 13 upholding and improving policy directives for governing China. Party leadership comes first. The others cover many areas, including socialist democracy, socialist rule of law, the government administration system, socialist governance, the party and state oversight systems, and the like. The fourth plenum portrays a grand vision, but stresses real world practice. So, Professor Fong, I'd like you to take uh, this concept of institutionalization uh, and, and see what are the kinds of applications it would have in um, upholding and reforming the system. So, what are the, what are the areas that institutionalization uh, would be helpful in order to make progress uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the continuing uh, improvement of China's capacity for governance. We believe that Zhidu or a set of established mechanisms mainly involves power and the distribution and limit of power. Take the National People's Congress, the highest power institution in China, for example. What kind of things are determined by the National People's Congress? Regulations like this are called Zhidu or set of established mechanisms. What is Tiji or institutional system? It is in fact rules and procedures for serving for the operations of power system. I'd like to talk more about how political system and Tiji or institutional system are separated and it has something to do with the reforms in Eastern Europe. In China we have a type of reform that we talk about today that can be traced back to the past economic reforms from Eastern Europe. Most notably the work of Vladimir Bruce from Poland who proposed a model of power division. Reform today is a legitimate positive word, but that was not true then. People then used to believe socialism was sacred and no reform was needed. How could anyone reform socialism when it was deemed the only truth? In fact, however, socialism needs reform. Bruce came up with an idea where he distinguished the content and form or the essence and symptom of Marxism. He said socialism is fine and we need not to change socialism. But the form of socialism has issues. Thus what he intended to change was the form of socialism, not socialism itself. And with that the discourse of the legitimacy of reform was established. In terms of political institutionalization, I think there are several stages. What is institutionalization? With institutionalization, things would operate autonomously like a machine. It is no longer the rule of man, but the rule of law. That is what we pursue. First, it is the institutionalization of decision making. There is a crucial guiding mechanism, the rules of procedures of the party committee in many entities or factories or large-scale enterprises, including government bodies in particular, the rules of procedure of the party committee are posted in the meeting rooms. 
As secretary of the party committee of the Institute of Political Science, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, I need to call and host party committee meetings. How to hold these meetings? In the past, I had to say over how to conduct the meetings. But now it is not for me to decide. We have a due process for those decisions. For example, if we are to talk about personnel issues, I will be the last to take the floor. That is the process. You've described quite uh, in detail and very richly the process by which um, the, the system works independent of, of the area. It could be a research institution, it could be part of the government. Um, I'd like to, to, to ask, are there specific um, areas of China where you've seen the institutionalization have an impact? For example, in health care, um, the reforms in health care or in education. Uh, or in the management and reform of state-owned enterprises. Can you see a, a, a specific um, example of a, of, a, of a sector in China where you see progress in institutionalization? There are many cases in point. For example, I went to Sichuan province for a township democratic consultative meeting that was held there. Before the meeting, the villagers' opinions were solicited to identify the problems. That was the first procedure, opinion solicitation. Second, after villagers' voices were heard, discussions were held within the villagers' groups. The participants could decide what to submit to the township meeting and what to hold for now. Third is democratic consultations at the township meeting. I was there. Villagers are represented with one representative for each village. They were divided into five groups, occupying the four corners and one central space in a large room. I joined the group located at the center. They talked about villagers' concerns, discussed solutions, and proposed actions for the party committees and governments. The third procedure was to come to a consensus after group discussions through democratic consultation. Fourth, a great gathering was held when each group's opinion is reported to the moderator in written form. Fifth, questionnaires like ballot tickets were handed out to representatives to vote on each suggestion that was presented. Finally, the results get announced. Suggestions that are agreed upon by the majority are reported to the township party committee and local governments for reference in their policy making. Each major decision is to be made employing such a process. That is unlike the past, when a township party secretary or the township and village leaders would decide what to do. Today, that due process is here to stay. Without consultation, no decisions can be made. What will it take in terms of continuing to improve the system and uh, moving towards more institutionalization? in order to reach that goal. So I'd like everybody to give a, a short answer. Uh, and if you also want to say, what are the challenges? What, what are the, between now and then, what, are, what may be the difficulties? We confront multiple internal and external challenges. Some can be seen now. Some will emerge in the next 30 to 40 years. That said, it is important that the CBC elites have flesh and blood ties and work in unity with the general public. In particular, the CBC should always accept correct opinions or well-intentioned advice like water flowing downward swiftly and smoothly, and keep practicing and exploring, correct the wrongs and forging ahead. I believe our world will be an increasingly better place that way. Professor Mahoney. Yeah, I think I agree with much of what he said, but to, to speak about some of the more specific obstacles and things that, that I know that that uh, the, the government and the party are, are, are working on now. Obviously, poverty alleviation is, is a key issue, as Xi Jinping has noted that he spent more time on that issue than anything else. But uh, in addition to this, right, um, there's still larger issues of income inequality. Um, along with the, the rise of the market, uh, we had uh, increases in gender inequality that need to be addressed. But again, um, maybe uh, the real issue, the central issue, as, as you noted, is maintaining uh, unity, um, uh, disciplining the party, keeping people on the same page, 
and making sure that the people and the party are on the same page, uh, as you said, so everyone can work together to reach a common goal. What do you see between now and uh, 2050 as the challenges or the opportunities? When systems need to be improved, our job is to cultivate qualified talent, meaning people who have both the ability and political integrity and follow the tenet of politically serving the people. Capability-wise, they are to meet the demands of modern governance. Such talents include party members cultivated by the party school of the Central Committee of CPC and people with democratic parties and no party affiliation cultivated by the Academy of Chinese Culture. In fact, China faces two difficult tasks. First, how to ensure the people running the country, that is, how to economically master that means of production. Secondly, how to handle power. That relies on the CPC's leadership. If we can figure out this problem, we will know which course to take. The modernization of China's system proposed by the fourth plenary session of the 19th CPC Central Committee is to ensure an all-encompassing role of the CPC in institutional operations and ensure the party's comprehensive leadership remains close to the people, which is the core issue of all of our problems. I promise all my friends that 30 years from today, we're going to come back here, all five of us, and we're going to assess what we've said and see how accurate we were. So see you then. The 2019 fourth plenary session focused on the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics, including its enforcement capability. That's China's path. The fourth plenum communique presented 13 directives, most beginning with words like upholding and improving that are designed to modernize the country's system and capacity for governance. In the communique, the word zhidu appears 77 times. It means system in the sense of establishing institutions or the institutionalization of governance. That's China's model. Plenum communiques stress those matters about which leadership is most concerned. At the fourth plenum, this concern was making greater efforts in upholding and improving the system of governance. This rings true. Indeed, throughout 2019, CPC General Secretary Xi Jinping has been criticizing slackness in spirit among party officials. And the party launched a campaign centered around its latest slogan, remain true to our original aspirations, keep our mission firmly in mind. The fourth plenum highlighted that strict governance of the party must be exercised, that party officials must observe party regulations. With the party now directly implementing as well as formulating all policy, government, economy, business, military, society, culture, education. To watch China, we must watch the party to be closer to China.